Welcome to a care collab on Dendrobium Roy Tokonaga, a very, very popular cross. Strangely enough, though, last year I did a care video on this orchid all by my lonesome, but this time there was a lot of response from that video and we have ourselves more channels joining in for the care of Dendrobium Roy Tokonaga. So I'm very happy to say that there's plenty of links in the description that you can have a look at. If my setup is not something that you would like to get into, it is Lekka and self-watering and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail further into the video, but plenty of setups, different environments, different care methods for this fabulous cross of a Dendrobium. Right, so let's get the setup out of the way because if this is not to your liking, then you can click out very, very quickly and head over to the video links in the description and see if there's something else that is more with your preferred method of growing orchids. I am in Lekka and self-watering. Actually, not me. My Dendrobium Roy Tokonaga is in Lekka and self-watering and she has been from day one. I received her back in 2018. She was quite the good looking orchid, but she was in a pot with sphagnum moss and very old, nasty, degraded sphagnum moss at that. I am here in southern Spain. I have very little humidity to speak of in my climate. Very hot, dry winds. None of those represented here today. We are in April and it is one of the chilliest springs I have ever experienced in this region. So the wind that you're seeing right now is quite chilly and that could probably risk these buds from opening. We'll get to that. My setup, Lekka and Self-Watering, is here to help me buffer against the lack of humidity I have in my climate. Also, it is a massive aid to me because this orchid is extremely thirsty when she gets growing. The amount of water this orchid consumes when she gets her grow on is astounding. So Lekka Self-Watering works perfectly for me and you see, this is her first dose of seaweed for the year that went in in March. She is not quite absorbing that as quickly as she normally would when the season is underway. And that is because the season isn't really underway, even though the calendar says so. But needless to say, it works for me. What I do with this setup when it comes to watering is prior to anything going into the reservoir, be it fertilizer, supplements, or a silicon application, I flush the pot through twice using my mask as a measure with plain fresh RO water to get rid of the salts if there is any salt accumulation before I fill the reservoir with whatever treatment application I would like to put in. Not only is my setup very advantageous for me in my climate because of the watering and the additional humidity that the leaves will get evaporating from the Lekka, but also because this orchid grows some super sensitive roots. If you want to call it a quirk, that is what I consider a quirk with this orchid. The roots are like glass and the Lekka being inorganic means I don't have to switch out my media every year. If I were to grow her in pure sphagnum, moss in my climate, that is pretty much what she would need because of how hot things get and how much water she consumes when she is in active growth. So if I were to use sphagnum moss as my media, I would have to keep that wet all the time and I would have to change out the sphagnum moss every year simply because of how quickly it would degrade. And then to be touching those roots that snap even just when you look at them, trying to pick out the sphagnum moss and do that on a yearly basis. I mean, this orchid is vigorous, but there's only so much it's gonna take year in, year out. I am so glad that another effect of being in inorganic media means that I don't have to do this on a yearly basis and she's getting all the water that she needs. I spent hours not just soaking the orchid, removing the old sphagnum moss, re-soaking the orchid to remove more sphagnum moss, leaving her to soak so that sphagnum moss debris would fall away from the roots. I spent hours on this orchid. Every time I touched the roots, click, click, click. It was super stressful. Last year, I did a repot on her, and I did say when you repot this orchid, 
do it at the right time when new growths are growing and you will see new roots forming. That is the best time to get into this orchid simply because you need that backup plan when it comes to repotting this orchid. There is hardly any chance of saving a root if you are in organic media. Even if you are in inorganic media, I am telling you, I want to just put it out there. Know what you're heading into. Be brave. You're going to break roots. Do it when new roots are coming and your orchid will not experience as much of a setback. Mine did experience a setback. Not much of a setback, but enough that she was a bit stressed out. And it turned out there was actually two orchids in this pot last year and one section literally didn't make it and I could easily just pull it out. That is why my Roy Tokonaga doesn't look as big as it was last year. So there was a problem with the roots, even though I say be brave and do it, it is be brave and do it or don't do it. And then, well, we know what happens when we don't clean up our orchids. Long term, that is not an option either, but make sure you've got roots and be brave. Breathe on the roots and they will break. But to counteract the sensitivity of the roots of this orchid, she is a vigorous root grower. So it's not as if you have to fight for every single root that she is going to grow. No, she will regrow a new root system pretty, pretty quickly. And then during that time frame that you've repotted and new roots are growing, don't put her into the conditions that she can handle. Keep her a little bit more protected. That was my mistake. I put the orchid back in her position in the covered south facing portico of my blooming alley, even though she was not in direct sun. She was exposed to the elements, which is very hot winds, no humidity, and pretty much too much for an orchid that has just been repotted with sensitive roots growing a new root system. So the next time if I were to repot this orchid, I'm putting her indoors where she has a lot of bright shade, but doesn't have to deal with the extremes of the outdoor summers of Southern Spain. Considering that she's a Latoria type dendrobium, she is a continuous grower. At least it happens here with me. These are some very, very spiddly little growths that developed throughout the winter right here. So they are not to size because I don't fertilize her much during the winter. I do not provide her with the continuous warmth that she would thrive under. So my winters can be indoors down to 14 degrees Celsius, which is not very often, but that is the recorded low in that growth space. And they can be around 17 degrees maximum during the day if I have consecutive dull days, usually around the 20 degree mark. She would definitely prefer it a little warmer than that. And then she would perform even better. So during the winter, when these growths were developing right here, all I did was give her half of what I would normally do during the summer. She got 160 parts per million throughout the winter, seeing as she wasn't absorbing the reservoir as fast as she does when we get into the growing season. I am hoping to change that for the growths that are coming here right now, that I can push these growths with 300 parts per million, as is my custom. And then they should develop to about this size again, which is normal. We've got about 20 centimeters, pinky to thumb, the length of a growth. Now she could be quite a space hog if you don't train the orchid a little bit. You can see how the new growths could start flopping out, growing out over the edge. So what I do is I make sure that her light influence is always directed from the opposite side of where the growths are coming out. We got the growths out on this side, my light influence is coming from that side in the hopes that the growths will grow upright and more directed towards the light. Now. Let's get into the sensitivity of these buds. As vigorous and robust as this orchid is and how much she can tolerate if you are damaging her roots, her blooms and her buds are a completely different story. The spikes take a very, very long time to form and develop and boy, if you move her, she throws a fit and buds will blast. I filmed this orchid a couple of months ago while she was forming her buds. They were just peeking out and well, you know, promptly she had a problem with that. I already cut another spike off because all the buds were looking like this. So make sure that once you have your orchid in spike, it's gonna take at least three months to see blooms, I kid you not, from the first sighting to actually blooming out. 
three months. But the beauty of orchids that actually take so long to bloom out from seeing a spike until they bloom is the longevity of the blooms. That is what happens here with Androbium roy toconaga. The blooms last forever. Meanwhile, the spikes are still in bud. They haven't bloomed out. These blooms that you see now that are open they have been open for approximately three weeks. They look as fresh and beautiful as the first day when they open. Another great thing about this orchid is you can see that every node around the leaf line here will produce spikes year after year after year. Usually a new growth will form a spike from the top center leaf and then subsequent years, other nodes below the top apex will start to form spikes as well, giving this orchid year after year a better and more impressive bloom show. So eventually, this growth will bloom from the center, while the other growth will produce more spikes from the outer nodes. Amazing! and then long lasting. But one thing is she is not fragrant, which is unfortunate considering how long this orchid has its blooms. It would be wonderful to have the fragrance. When it comes to pests with this orchid, let me tell you that my experience, first of all, is that dendrobiums in my area are prone to thrips. So I have had some issues and some of the leaf curling that you see is because there was a little bit of a thrips issue at the beginning before I figured out what they were. I treat my orchids with a garlic infused alcohol solution and I have never seen thrips on this orchid again. No scale either, no mealybugs either. So once I figured out what it was, after that, Hakuna Matata, my Roy Tokonaga has never had another pest infestation. But just keep that in mind. Pests will love this orchid, especially in my case, thrips. Now, when it comes to light, also be a little bit more gentle than I've been here. I'm quite radical when it comes to acclimating orchids in my environment. I push them to a certain extreme to understand how much they can take. She does live in very, very bright shade, as I mentioned, under my south-facing covered portico, but sometimes the angle of the sun can be such that it comes through the trellising, through the curtain, and, you know, <clears throat> yeah, you don't want that. This is an extremely old growth right here. It's also finished blooming on all its nodes. You can see it's also smaller than any other growth. So at least they hold on to their leaves for a long time, giving a very lush appearance. But once you do some damage, uh, yeah, that's going to stick around for a long time as well. I do not cut these things off. These are all little pointers and reminders in my head. When I see that, I remember what I did wrong and I don't repeat it to the best of my ability, of course. <laughs> So, a beautiful, vigorous dendrobium hybrid that is only very, very ticklish when you touch its feet, as in the roots are super sensitive. Other than that, if you don't have to mess around with the roots on a yearly basis and can just grow it in an inorganic setup, let it fill its pot. This orchid can be in here if I don't have any more issues for at least another three and a half to four years. Even if, for example, let me just say that, even if, for example, these two growths were to grow another growth coming out from right there, it looks like it's right up against the pot, but the rhizome is what I'm looking at. What happens up here, that's okay. But if the rhizome is tight and there's eye on eye on eye, it's not a rambling rhizome, three or four years, this orchid in this pot, brilliant. If I had to grow her in organic media in my climate with the amount of water that she needs, I wouldn't be able to do that. I really hope that my care was helpful, that it gave you some ideas, some pointers. Clearly, if I haven't circled back on a thought, please let me know in the comments and I would be very, very happy to elaborate. Thank you to all the channels that reached out after my little care video last year, informing me that they also have this Roy Tokunaga. It did feel weird to do a care video on my own last year, <laughs> but here we are. More options, more varieties, and anything I can clear up, clarify about what I have mentioned today in my video, whoop, the comments are there for a reason and I look forward to the dialogue. Really appreciate your time watching my video. I want to wish you a beautiful day on one condition though, that you please stay safe. Take care. Bye.